Welcome to the Brew Crew Review Podcast, the show by fans for fans of your Milwaukee Brewers. Welcome back, Brewer fans, to the Brew Crew Review Podcast, with number 33. I am your host today, Vince Trevato, joined here on the set with Mr. Scott Bartell. Scott, how are you today? Uh, doing pretty good, and I hear Craig will be joining us uh, shortly, and unfortunately, um, wrestling and church festivals will prevent uh, Chad from joining us for this week's episode, but um, we got a lot to talk about, eh? Yeah, there is a lot to talk about, and uh, yeah, it's great that Craig will be joining us shortly. I know that he was uh, up at Lambeau for, it seems like the past several weeks, really enjoying the sights uh, up in Green Bay and the, the history and legacy of the Green Bay Packers. We know how big of a Packers fan he is, and even though it's not football season yet, uh, Craig was up at Lambeau doing some uh, scouting for Mark Antoniak's Football Maniacs uh, podcast, so it's, it's great that he'll be able to join us and talk some baseball today. Yep, and uh, also I no, no, let you know real, I've got a lot of um, stuff you want. what I, I I've got some um, uh, some great information from our inside source Tom Carter who's going to tell us all about the trade rumors a little bit of inside info on what might be happening by the time this airs so should be an interesting Scott, uh, Scott our anonymous source Tom Carter does not want his name used on the air just so you know you got to refer to him as either. T. Carter or Tom C. We've gone over this before, but our anonymous source, Tom Carter, again, does not want his name used on the air. So oh, please that's right. That he specifically said, don't say inside source here. He doesn't want anyone to know that he works at Miller Park, so you shouldn't say inside source either. Well, now that we're so, all here, we, we've got this. All right, Craig, thanks for joining us on the set today. How are things? Are, are you all right uh, coming back here from Lambo? Yeah, that was not there, uh, but that's okay. Um, yeah, I'm good. All right. Very good. I well, nearly hit a pedestrian, but that's that's not unexpected. Oh, we well, drove fan to West Dallas. You got to bring it. Gotta yeah, we do what I got to do. Yeah, no, we've driven with you before on many road trips across the country, and we know that uh, you know there's a lot of near misses. Let's just say that. So um, anyway, glad you're okay. Will, glad glad the pedestrian's okay. We don't know that they're okay though. Are they, Craig? I will also just process that there's a possibility that during today's podcast I may uh, be going for a taco bell drive through. We may interview your your doctor physician about the uh, the, the effects on the body of eating so much Taco Bell. Um, it may not be the most healthy option for you just as a, as a public service announcement. Uh, we're going to start off today's podcast um, by talking about the Brewers recap of last week. We had three home games against the Nationals where we won that series at Miller Park. Took two or three games of the Nationals, and then we went on to San Francisco for a four-game set. Won the first three games, and unfortunately lost the last one, but won the series five and two in the week. It was a huge bounce back from a couple of weeks that preceded it, and the Brewers hopefully are back on track. We made a couple of trades that we're going to be talking about here in a second. Um, but uh, upcoming this next week, um, we've got, um, let's see, we're going to be on the road in Los Angeles. We're going to come back to Miller Park next weekend and play a set against the Rockies. What are you guys' thoughts on last week and your predictions for this upcoming week for them, Washington Brewers? Yeah, it was a great bounce, bounce back week, Craig, like you alluded to. Um, great to see after, you know, very uh, much struggling to go into the all-star break uh, and then losing two or three of the Dodgers, including uh, in that series at home in Milwaukee. It was great to see the Brewers uh, have a very successful series against the Nationals and then to, uh, to play the Giants. And a, a lot of Brewer fans get really worried whenever the team goes on the West Coast. I know that there's been a lot of other uh, disastrous West Coast road trips for the Brewers over the years, and it's, uh, we obviously don't know what's going to happen in Los Angeles when we play the Dodgers next week. But it's great to see uh, the Brewers go into San Francisco and win three or four games. Scott? Yeah, I think, um, yeah, two or three for the Nationals. I think I, I actually said I thought we were going to be, what, four and three on this trip, and looks like we're going to wind up being five and two, which is very exciting. Uh, so after, yeah, after last week, which was possibly the worst week in Brewers history, uh, it was definitely 
uh, a great thing. And I really hope that obviously our, our new players, new trades uh, have injected a little bit more life into the clubhouse and hopefully this team is fired up to make a great playoff push. Um, so guys, we made some moves this week. Uh, the Brewers have uh, made a couple acquisitions. Um, this past week, it's been a busy week for David Stearns and the trade deadline is not here yet. So I think it happened on Thursday, I want to say. We acquired all-star right-hander Joaquin Soria from the Chicago White Sox. For two players in cash, we, um, yeah, we, we actually got, uh, let's see here. Well, uh, we had to give up Cody Medeiros, and uh, that's the uh, left-hander prospect and right-hander Wilbur Perez. Uh, I think Cody is definitely the headliner of those two, but. Yeah, um, and we've talked a lot about Cody Medeiros, you know, over the years on our show, guys. Cody was the number one draft pick by the Brewers, uh, was that 2014, I believe? Um, Craig, you're the you're definitely twelfth overall league. pick. Yeah, twelfth overall pick, and you're definitely the minor league expert here on this on this show. What what are your thoughts on uh, getting getting rid of Madero? It seemed like he had turned it around a little bit this year. He did not put up impressive numbers in his first uh, you know few seasons of pro ball, and seemed to be developing a bit slowly. But love to hear your take on on Kogi and if that was too expensive to give up uh, for a guy like uh, Soria. Um, I think. Overall, it was probably a fair deal for both teams um, in the position that they're in. It's disappointing as a Brewer fan to give up on someone they drafted so high, but he was doing pretty horrific in the minor leagues and, and was on track to basically never make it in the major leagues as of last season. This year he has turned it around, and lefties do develop uh, kind of later than most pitchers, and he was drafted out of high school, so he's still very young. Um, I think the Brewers gave up on him a little quick, but once again, um, you know, we it's a trade that they probably had to make. And um, like I said, I think it was fair for both clubs. I sad to see him go, but I think I think overall, uh, Surrey is going to make a difference in our bullpen. What are your guys' thoughts? Well, we should also quickly point out, too, uh, Craig, uh, that Soria does have a, there's a team option on him for next year, so it's not a pure rental um, if the Brewers decide to pick up that option. I, Scott, you've got the numbers in front of you from our intern, Esmeralda, but I think that it was um, a $10 million option for next year. Is that right? Or is that, you is got that, it. Yeah, $10 million for next year, which is a lot for a bullpen arm. Um, it seems like, at least according to what Stearns has spent, you know, thus far on the bullpen over the years. But um, just wanted to throw that out there, that at least it's not purely for a rental if the Brewers decide that they want them for the bullpen next year as well. Scott, what what did you think? No, I think it's. I mean, he's he's definitely going to be a great acquisition to already a strength of ours. Um, I mean, when you look at it, um, he he's going to fit right in with an already dominant bullpen. And I guess the thing that I like most about it is because he's been a closer for a while. Should something happen to Knable, who um, you know is definitely a proven closer at this point, but also has been, um, I guess making Brewer fans um, uh, bite their nails a little bit more than they probably want to. Uh, should something happen with him uh, and he's unable to fulfill his duties as closer, we'll have a veteran closer to step right in. So I think that that kind of bullpen depth is definitely going to help us down the stretch here. Yeah, interesting point on that, Scott. I, I did see an article this week that talked about the Brewers perhaps reverting to a closer by committee approach in the ninth inning uh, going forward and, you know, right now in the pen, we, between Jeremy Jeffers and Corey Knable and now Joaquin Soria, we do have three guys opposing experience, not to mention Josh Hader, who uh, I think did close a couple games out when Knable was injured earlier in the season. Um, do you guys like that approach, the closer by committee approach, or was that just maybe a rumor that was out there and Knable gets a, a lot longer leash, or what are you guys' thoughts on that and the impact that it's going to have because of this trade? I wonder if it's just like a polite way of saying that Knievel, you're not necessarily going to be the closer day in and day out. Um, there were a few times recently anyway, where uh, he struggled uh, just walking batters and getting, unfortunately the, you know, the tying run at the plate then suddenly by just walking the guy. Um, and I think that that's the type of thing that's not very tolerable as a closer. And I don't know, maybe that's just a polite way of saying, I mean, there were times when it happened too that we didn't have, there's nobody else warming up there. 
there's nobody that's going to be able to step in because most of the bullpen uh, that we had left was just kind of people that I wouldn't want to close either. So, yeah, I don't know. Should be good. Yeah, to answer Vince's question about the closer roles on a previous pocket, when Knievel went down with injury, I, I had said that I prefer to find roles, and I thought bullpen guys like to know when they're coming in and all that stuff from a mental preparation standpoint. However, during the when uh, Knievel was out, and I think it was, we thought it was going to be more of an extended absence, but it ended up only being a little over a month, I believe, when he was actually out. Uh, as we returned pretty quickly from injury. During that month, might have been the Brewers' bullpen best stretch of the, of the entire season. Uh, and, no, and there were no defined roles, and it worked out really well. But I think Josh Hader's dominance was a huge part of making that mix a success. Um, so, I, I, I mean, obviously, people thought when Enable was out, Hader was our next best pitcher, so he'd automatically be the closer role. But that proved to not be the case because he's more valuable – in that role where we can put them in where we need them, um, as Scott called it, the fireman role. But um, and and not only just against lefties there. Anytime we need a clean inning or throw the heart of the lineup anywhere through the seventh through the ninth inning, that's where we use Hater, which is kind of a revolutionary way to use your bullpen, especially with a dominant guy like that. So that worked out great. Uh, but when Kneel did come back, there were some hints that they're, that they're going to keep that kind of you know undefined roles, but it seemed like they kind of went back to traditional sense and the bullpen still been very good. So I would kind of stick with that role. Obviously, what, like what Scott said, Soria having closing experience, which doesn't mean a ton to me, but the fact that he can handle it um, is fine, and he obviously probably would be the fallback option. If there was, you know, something that happened to Canaveral, whether he got pulled from the role or injured or something like that, I think Soria would slide into kind of that ninth inning role and Cater would never be left where he is. I don't think that's going to change, and that's the best for the Brewers bullpen for sure. Yeah, and I, I you know, I, I guess I didn't, um, didn't really opine yet on the actual trade. I, I really like the trade. I think that Soria, just because of his long track record, having a guy like that in the pen is, is I think, a really good thing. You added another quality arm to the bullpen, and in exchange, you give up a guy who I, I, I guess was viewed as a top prospect at one point, but who really hasn't proven that he can get even minor league batters are out. So, you know, when you're the Brewers and you're making a run this year and you're um, a game and a half or a half game out of first place. And, you know, you, you've got to look at ways to strengthen your club. And I think that this was a very good move. And um, given the fact that we do have a team option on for next year, and you're not just a strictly a rental player, I, I really like it. And I think that it kind of goes back to the 2011 Brewers team that had such a light belt bullpen at the end of games where you had Axford being set up by Francisco Rodriguez, who was being set up by Latroy Hawkins, who, was being set up by Takashi Saido, and you really had four lights out guys pitching the sixth through the ninth innings. And if the Brewers can um, use these guys in uh, whatever role that they did, that they deem fit, I really think that we could have that sort of lights out, um, you know, rotation at, essentially at the end of the bullpen with with Hader and hopefully Knable and and Soria and and um, you know other guys have performed pretty well out there. Taylor Williams has had a few ups and downs this year, but overall he's been fairly solid. And um, I, I think it could be a really good move for the Brewers, especially if they are able to make the postseason. Yeah, and I guess the other part uh, about that is considering that at the time of this tape anyway, the Brewers really still don't have like a true ace, and we definitely don't have anybody that consistently gets into uh, the seventh, sometimes even the sixth inning. Um, it's really, really important that we have a lot of good fresh arms in that bullpen that are going to be able to step up, and um, maybe this is, you know, the, the Stern's way of building a dominant pitching staff by having guys that, you know, maybe they'll only go five innings, maybe that's by design or six innings, and they'll only give up a run or two, and then the bullpen could take over. So uh, that bullpen depth is definitely going to help. Yeah, and it's certainly the trend right now in Major League Baseball to have your starters throw less innings and your bullpen, you know, throw more. And, um, you know, if that's, if that's the case, the Brewers can use – what they have to their advantage, I think, in, in certain ways. And I, I think overall it could be a very good thing. I, I'm not as enthused. I think the Brewers would pick up sort of $10 million option for next year. But to me, uh, I mean, I, all Brewer fans seem to not be on board with, like, picking up an option for someone like Cole Hamels. Obviously, that $20 million option is a little bit different. But to not even bad eye at picking up a $10 million option on a reliever, I think is a little bit alarming to me. 
I mean, Surrey has a nice track record, but I, I don't think his market value is much more than $10 million. So, um, and I, I think, it, you know, if the Brewers were searching for free agents next offseason, Surrey was a free agent. I don't necessarily think they can throw $10 million at him. So, I think that's the part that bothers me the most about the trade is we did have to give up some prospect cap, capital for someone who is kind of just signed at market value, so to speak. Um, but obviously, that's why it makes sense for both teams because White Sox are looking to shed payroll and, and collect more younger talent, and we're kind of in the opposite boat as we, as of the day, when we're leading the wild card uh, race in the NL. So, I mean, like, just getting back to it makes sense for both clubs. And I do like Surya, and we shall see. I think the bullpen has just strengthens it, and I think everyone did think that we were going to get another bullpen arm, mostly some, someone experienced so that we don't have to rely on the young guys like Taylor Williams or Jacob Barnes are showing some signs of, uh, you know, of their youth, basically. Yeah, I get what you're saying about Hamels. I, you know, having half of that dollar amount to Brewers uh, next year, I think, is a factor. You know, $10 million versus $20 million is a big deal for a team like the Brewers, especially in – um, honestly, Soria's numbers have been more effective uh, this season. And, you know, we can definitely debate roles of starter versus guys in the bullpen, and there's probably more value, obviously, in a, in a quality starter than there is in a guy in the bullpen. But that being said, um, you know, the prospect capital thing, I don't know what other trade Stearns is going to be looking at making in, in the next couple of days. So um, I'm not as worked up about it. And last week, Scott and I talked quite a bit about using guys for trades that we probably couldn't have protected anyways uh, on the 40 man roster um, going forward, who, we, who guys who we might be losing the rule five draft. So unless we really handicapped ourselves going into the next three days, two days worth of uh, potential trades here at the deadline, I don't see it as a huge, huge deal um, just because we are probably likely losing a guy like Madero anyways, or someone else um, who wouldn't be protected because he was on the roster. So, that's kind of how I'm viewing a lot of these guys that are still on that 40 man roster bubble right now. Well, I'll just say I'm glad that it isn't a $10 million option on Surya and that a slam dunk that we will pick it up. I mean, uh, if we don't pick it up, we can negotiate a smaller salary or he could test the water or who knows uh, what the plan is. But the reason I say that is because I'm pretty intrigued with the 2000. 18-19 offseason free agent starting pitching class, and unless the Brewers make a move in the next couple of days here before the deadline to acquire a young cost control starter, there's some nice names that are going to be out free agents that the Brewers would like to have the you know payroll flexibility to sign to a long-term type deal. Um, so yeah, obviously I'm just never a fan of unless there's a real life out guy to spend ten million dollars on a bullpen arm. Um, but once again, things are changing in the way people are building their pitching staff. The Brewers are kind of at the forefront of that, falling by, you know, behind teams like the Indians, you know, all like they do with Andrew Miller. And they even did this year when they still have Miller and Cody Allen, and they traded for Brad Hand and Adam Cinder or whatever. So, so I, obviously they're really slow finding the bullpen. I think the Brewers are in the same boat with that, and it's a different way to look at things. But with that said, I think that. Stern's done a good job in the years he's been GM to build kind of a cheaper bullpen, so to speak. And so there's that. So Okay, Welcome. so moving on to the details of our next trade. Yeah, it looks out, like uh, we have seven minutes to talk about Mike Moustakas, eh? Yeah, big trade, guys. That was a, that was a big deal. And uh, I'm sure as most Brewer fans already know, Brewers acquired third base and Mike Moustakas from the Kansas City Royals in exchange for center fielder Brett Phillips. Um, another big name and also left-handed reliever Jorge Lopez. Um, some thought that giving up Phillips in a trade like this uh, for a rental was a bit much. Um, I didn't happen to agree with that assessment. What do you guys? What do you guys think about this trade? You can go first, Scott. All right. Well, there's a little. This is a very, very interesting trade because obviously the Brewers lost out on Machado. And uh, supposedly we had the second best offer out there, which means absolutely nothing other than we did not get <laughs> Manny Machado. Um, having said that, we st Stern stepped up his game a little bit and decided to make a trade for Mike Moustakas, who is the third baseman. Travis Shaw is the third baseman. Uh, what are we going to do? Uh, well, apparently uh, we're going to take a page out of uh, Moneyball and we're just going to, 
uh, tell Travis Shaw that he's going to do his best uh, Scott Hatterberg impression, and he's going to play second. And apparently he practiced second base for almost a week before this trade happened, and apparently the Brewers' uh, brass liked what they saw, and Travis Shaw's moving to second base. So there's a lot of stuff going on here. What do you guys think? Um, yeah, I, I think that the Stearns must have identified Moustakis as a target up the week before this trade happened because of the things that you mentioned, like trying to sh- sh- at least in practice at second base, and they determined that it's going to be something Shaw could handle and therefore pull the trigger. So there's a gamble there, and that's what I kind of like about it, the fact that you know we could have just settled for someone like Estrella Cabrera and outbid uh, you know, the Phillies for them who eventually landed him or for – uh, Escobar from the Twins, who the Diamondbacks landed. I don't really like either of those guys. I like Moustak as a bat a lot better if Shaw can play second base, obviously. So it's a gamble, but I think it's going to pay off. And Moustak is obviously have a left-handed and a bat over those other guys as well, uh, which I think is led to the Brewers lineup and uh, the power potential. And we really did need that, like, fifth, sixth hitter. Um, and I think Moustak is, pro- you know, really – profiles well there so I think it's really going to help our offense and our offense definitely needed a shot in the arm more so even than our possible starting pitching the way that the numbers at least fall so kudos to Stern for pulling it off and I I hope it works out from a defensive standpoint Uh, and it's definitely an exciting trade in my opinion yeah I'll echo what you guys said I think that um, it is a calculated gamble it is a risk but that being said now we've got both Travis Straw and Mike Moustak as bats in the lineup which is great um, I didn't think that the Brewers weren't necessarily focused on just looking for a third baseman, um, that they were just focused on infielders in general, guys who could play second, third, or short, and they wanted to know what their options were, which is why they moved Shaw over to start taking some grounders at second. And, and this just worked out being the guy that was um, available for the right price, I guess, in David Stearns' eyes. So I'm, I'm really excited, though, uh, like Craig mentioned, the stock is being a lefty, is big. Um, he's got crazy power numbers. He's already hit 20 home runs off the season, which is great. Um, so and I think that his stuff really plays well in North Park, which is another factor in this trade. If he's already put up 20 bombs in Royal uh, Stadium, um, I think he's really going to like that porch out in right field uh, at North Park. So very excited about about seeing what he can do um, once the team gets back home to Milwaukee. Also want to point out that he has a mutual option for $15 million next year. And for some reason, even though um, he didn't really get a lot – of interest uh, in the off season. I, I actually think being a Boris client, I, I don't know. I, he's going into what his age 30 season. I wouldn't be surprised yeah. if he opts out. So this could very well wind up being a rental. It could be. Yeah. Uh, especially at that price tag. We'll see what happens. I'm, I'm interested as well, but he did have a, a I think a fairly negative um, experience last winter in free agency where he didn't get nearly what he wanted. Ended up returning to the Royals for, I think 6.8 something yeah. along those lines. And, uh, you know, maybe he wants to, to essentially find a new home for a little bit. I can see Sacco coming back and Shaw being trade bait, or if he works at second base, great. Um, uh, we'll see what happens. But uh, it'll be really interesting to see how this plays out once we get to the offseason. And hopefully it's after, you know, two, two and a half months of very productive baseball from Mike Moustakis and the Brewers uniform. I do agree with Scott that I think that uh, Moustakis and his agent – uh, will decline the mutual option and he will, he will end up being a rental for the Brewers. But I think that's kind of what we were talking anyways. And with that being said, then Shaw can probably slide back in the third base. Unless yeah. the second base environment really takes off, maybe he'll be our future second baseman. The thing I like the most about the trade is that Brad Miller is no longer with the team and John MVR is going to be struggling to get at that. So uh, yeah, I'm we fine with we... both those things. Uh, VR hasn't been terrible this year, but I, I like Sean Moore and his, he's, uh, you know, able to provide a type of game that VR cannot. And um, I don't think that we lost a ton of Brett Phillips. I think he was an ideal fourth outfielder for the Brewers. I, I love his, his arm out in the outfield. But that being said, you know, when you're shooting for, for a playoff berth, I don't know that Phillips is the best guy to have um, in our outfield. And I, I was not as high on him as some others were um, in terms of rating him as a prospect. So, um I'm all right with giving him up in the right trade. And I think this is the right trade for the Brewers in 2018. And best of luck to Brett as uh, he moves uh, along to Kansas City. And, and Jorge Lopez is a guy that, you know, was at one time ranked as a fairly high pitching prospect in this organization. But at this point, it just turned into an extra and expendable bullpen army. have been up and down between Milwaukee and Colorado Springs quite a bit during the season. So 
Um, overall, I don't think that we lost a ton in this trade, other than the fact that we can't use Phillips now as a trade chip here in the next couple of days if Stearns didn't want to pull off another move. If you're listening to this, it's still hours before the deadline, and we're hoping Stearns has got another move up his sleeve. In fact, according to Adam McKelvey, he, uh, Stearns, Stearns mentioned to him that he still might have another trade or two left him here before the deadline hits. Uh, my guess is we'll be talking a starting pitcher, but uh, especially with the injuries to Suter was up for the year. Davies, who's questionable to come back. And, of course, Nelson, who's never came back yet. I think the Brewers' depth of starting pitching is definitely in question. Um, so what are, you, what are you guys' thoughts on what do you think Stearns might be up to in the next 24 hours or so for the uh, non-waiver trade deadline? And what you're hoping he – what type of player are you hoping he targets to add to the Milwaukee Brewers' uh, – Wild card championship series, hopefully. Yeah, it's, it's hard to pro- it's hard to project David Stearns. You know, he surprised us. Um, I think throughout his tenure here in Milwaukee, including just this past couple of days with the acquisition of a bunch of stockists. I do think the Brewers are obviously actively looking at starting pitchers. They're um, they've been rumored to be out there on a number of guys and at least ticking the tires uh, with a lot of different teams right now. So uh, I don't know. I don't think that Stearns is going to give up um, a ton of of prospect capital unless it's a big top the rotation type of guy. Um, I think he could deal from the well of guys that are going to be left off the 40 man with the rule five draft selection next year anyways. Uh, so I would guess we acquire a starter, but not a top of the rotation guy. Maybe somebody that we're either buying low on or, um, or perhaps a, a, a guy like a Matt Harvey or maybe a Zach Wheeler type, um, you know, a guy like a three or four starter. Um, but but who, but who knows? Stern surprises us a lot. So who knows? Yeah, I'm starting to think. I don't know. I I have a feeling that at this point, if if we don't make another trade, uh, I still feel really good about this team. Having said that, I think that uh, Stearns might be playing the waiting game with some of these other franchises that might be trying to shed a little bit of payroll. Uh, some of those other smaller markets like Milwaukee that uh, this time of year, unfortunately, we have to try to cut payroll any way that they can. So I wouldn't be surprised if that happens, and I really wouldn't be surprised if it happened at catcher. Um, I know before the Luke Roy trade years ago, we had talked about how, um, you know, teams that are in a playoff push are unwilling usually to acquire a catcher, had the whole, you know, rotation and relievers have to adjust to a brand new catcher uh, in the middle of the season like that. Um, I wouldn't be surprised, though, if we went out and did something like that. Um, and I I guess with – let's see. Well, let's see here. Um, one of our interns put this together for me, asked for a list of stuff. Um, maybe – I mean, if, if you want, like, a wish list, I guess, of a, a catcher you might be looking for, um, Wilson Ramos with the Rays. Um, and then to a much, much lesser extent, um, you could get like uh, Rene Rivera, Nick Hundley, AJ Ellis, somebody like that. Isn't, isn't uh, Ramos still on the disabled list yet? I believe that he is. I think he's going to come off after the deadline as well. But I believe that, I mean, he's – you might still be able to swing a trade, I think, even if he's on the DL. Yeah, you're allowed you, to, but yeah, you're allowed to. Not but good it's idea. just not really a good idea. idea. How much impact <laughs> could a guy who's on the DL have for us? You know, I think that um, to your point, though, I think that that Stearns in the front office were really disappointed that Stephen Vogt was um, going to be out for the rest of the year. So I, I do think that they tried to fill the gaps a little bit with guys like Eric Kratz and we still Christian Bethencourt in the in minor leagues, but. Um, yeah, I just don't know with Ramos' injury if he's going to be um, any sort of, uh, you know, benefit for us to acquire at this point. Maybe he is. Maybe he can come back quicker from his injury than thought. But um, just it, it's unfortunate the timing of his injury. Otherwise, I think he would have been an ideal candidate. Um, I will say, though, too, that Stearns has, has shown that he is willing to get a catcher during the season. Uh, last year, Stephen Vogt is an example of that. And I know he wasn't quite exactly at the deadline. He was brought in in June. But um, there's an example of a guy who got – Quite a, quite a few at-bats uh, coming in, you know, almost halfway through the season last year. Well, and JT Riamuto, he still hasn't gone anywhere. I mean, his name's been kicked around, I don't know, for about the last six months. So, you never know. And, and if we were to acquire a guy like Riamuto, which I would be all for in terms of his, his talent, um, we would have to 
be very careful. I don't know if we can get a starting pitcher with the prospects that we have left, at least not a top of rotation guy, at least if we were going to use probably three of our top prospects to get a guy like Real Muto. I would think you'd take at least two and a couple wild, uh, a couple lottery tickets, so to speak, um, or three of our top ten. But uh, I could be wrong. Who knows? It is the Marlins, so you never know. Yeah, I guess my take on Stearns is he's really holding dear to his top prospects, which I think uh, could be a smart thing. Um, but with that being said, I don't think he's going to necessarily acquire someone like that. Um, instead, he's going to use those fringe prospects that might have to be casualties of a 40-man or, or players that don't necessarily need uh, any more <clears throat> uh, Domingo Santana, um, something like that. Uh, but I wouldn't be surprised if he tries to flip either um, – Woodruff for Luis Ortiz um, for a more veteran starting pitcher, but possibly not a controllable young one, you know, like Gosman Bundy or Strowman or something like that. But instead, possibly someone like Matt Harvey or Zach Wheeler. Um, again, not that exciting, but I think he could hit either of those guys without giving up any of our real top blue ship prospects or even future blue ship prospects and I'm referring to them as someone like, you know, um, Corey Ray who's really turning around or Zach Brown who's kind of breaking out. I think that you can hold on to all those guys and, and kind of just, you know, possibly jettison some of these fringe guys that um, just to solidify the starting rotation. But Scott, it, it surprised me that you said that you'd be happy if the Brewers went in forward with this team. You honestly, if he doesn't make a move for a starting pitcher, you're honestly, it seems like you're concerned with catcher, which uh, that's, you know, legitimate concern, but are you really comfortable with the injuries, like with our current starting pitching depth? I think that this team right now, even with the injuries, is still a playoff team. Now, would we benefit from getting an, an actual top-line starter that can actually go you know, more than six innings? Absolutely. I just don't know that as a small market if we should be giving up the farm uh, to acquire such a thing. If we did um, – I would be looking more at like an ace rental type like CC was back in the day with us or like Cole Hamels would have been this year. But um, I don't know. I mean, I, I just don't want, like when you look at, when we talk about like DeGrom or somebody like that, I just don't know if that's Stern's philosophy or not to be able to get a guy that, that is that good, but is going to cost us an awful lot of money and an awful lot of prospects. Yeah, well, I think if you're looking if the Grand's actually made available. Oh, sorry, Ben. Uh, if he's actually made available, I think he'd be more along the lines of a Christian Yelich type, once in a yeah. once in a very blue moon opportunity, where then you gotta at least put an offer in and pony up the prospects if if he's available. But unfortunately, I don't think we have to worry about that because I, I think I'm, in spite of the rumors, I don't think the Mets are making them available. And if they are, they'd have to be completely blown away. So price to the Brewers, the Stearns or Brewer fans would not be happy to pay. So, yeah, I do. I did. I would say that anybody would be available for Degrom. You know, in terms of our top ten prospects, for sure. And I think that a top of the rotation starter would be great. A rental, I don't know who's exactly available as a pure rental. And I think I disagree with you guys on Cole Hamels. I see his numbers this year are pretty pedestrian. But more than that, I don't think that Hamels would have exercised. Uh, he would, would have exercised his no-trade uh, clause to Milwaukee unless his option for next season was picked up at $20 million. And I don't think that Stearns or anybody would necessarily be looking to pay a guy like Hamill $20 million for next year with an ERA close to five. So I really, you know, he could have been valuable for us, I guess, in the stretch here, but I just don't see how we could have acquired him without without that financial commitment for next season. It really sucks because the Cubs didn't have to, and they only had to kick in $5 million and the Rangers paid the the uh, rest and they have quite a pretty nice side they're going to plug in a fourth or fifth starter role on, a, on an already pretty good team that's unfortunate that they're our rivals but uh, right. we're not going to give up any Hamill, prospects to get them no but Hamill didn't have the Cubs on his no trade list I think there was only 10 yeah, teams so that's that, another that was a big factor I think in this one if it would have been again another a pure factor rental, in why it didn't happen yeah if it would have been just a pure rental for 2018 and it was Cole Hamels uh, despite the, the numbers this year I think that you go out and you get them you know for especially what the Cubs gave up or if it was just money for for this season again I just don't think that a team like the Brewers that you know is in the Milwaukee market wants to spend 20 million dollars on uh, you know a guy who's who's posting a five ERA almost at this point absolutely um, all right well any other thoughts or wrap up the show guys 
No, we've got no thoughts at all, Craig. We hope that our colleague Chad uh, Collins joins us um, soon uh, on our next podcast. I think that uh, the plan is to come with another podcast right after the deadline is done uh, for our show on Wednesday. So we look for that uh, per usual midweek next week. Um, and uh, Scott, do you want to throw out our, our Twitter handle and uh, email information for the fans? Yeah, I guess. No, it's uh, <laughs> um, on Twitter. Feel free to ask us any questions or just follow along. We're going to be, I mean, we've been live tweeting a good amount of the games lately and, uh, just having a lot of uh, overall Brewers banter. And I guess, you know, even if you're just a casual Brewer fan, this is probably the place for you anyway. Uh, but that is Brew Crew Review and then the number one. Uh, that's on Twitter. So, Yeah, and email us any questions at Brew Crew Review Podcast with an S at gmail.com. Um, we should be able to get to a few of your questions on Wednesday in our mailbag. Why do we have it with an S? We only have one podcast. I guess for now, we could expand. Well, Scott, this is this is podcast number 33, so we've got 33 podcasts. Well, I thought it was like one podcast, but then they're all like episodes, but I guess, yeah. Okay. Well, we say at the beginning, podcast number 33, and our anonymous source, Tom Carter, is full us to just do the S at the end of it. You remember that oh, conversation yeah. we had with Tom? Yeah. It's one of the few times I've disagreed with Tom. He's usually you know, right on line with everything, but yeah. Yep. I agree. I agree. He's a great anonymous source. He does say that. Sorry, right, people, people are now beeping at me. So we should probably wrap this up guys. Why are they beeping <laughs> at you? What are you doing? Yeah. Craig, your driving from the road trips is uh, not improved. It sounds like. In the group review I'm mobile back them. in the day. <laughs> I'm on my phone right now, if you guys didn't notice. Uh, oh, yeah, okay. <laughs> All right, guys. Hands free is the way to be. Uh, stay classy, Wisconsin. Still Brewers. Stay classy, West Dallas. Stay, stay classy, Wisconsin. Stay classy, Taco Bell. More specifically, stay classy, West Dallas, Wisconsin, Taco Bell after the experience I just had through the drive through So, have a good <laughs> week. Go Brewers. Go Thank Brewers, guys. Go Brewers. Yeah. Thanks, guys. See you later.